Lisa Rigo. I'm the Radioactive Waste Project Director at Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And this is an introduction to the nuclear fuel chain, nuclear energy, radioactive waste, and introduction. Nuclear energy is dirty, dangerous, and expensive. It, there's just, just been a recent bailout in New York, which we're still trying to fight for nearly $8 billion to keep three old nuclear reactor, four old nuclear reactors running that would have otherwise closed. This is just an overview of what we'll be covering. Uranium is the beginning of the nuclear fuel chain. Uranium is mined out of the ground, has been mined for decades. There are 520 abandoned uranium mines on Navajo land out west. And uh, these are open pit uranium mines, leaving huge scars on the land. Mining companies often abandon these sites. Radioactive dust and water threaten the health. Uranium is a natural element. It's part of the Earth's crust. Uh, there are uranium mines and uranium ore uh, around the world. The top four producers of uranium are Australia, Kazakhstan, the Russian Federation, and Canada, although others are very significant. This is a view of Australia, one of the highest producers of uranium. U.S. reactors have used this uranium and uranium from every other uh, mine area on Earth. Tailings waste from uranium mines leave a unique legacy, millions of tons of finely powdered radioactive rock. Charmaine Whiteface, who is with the Defenders of the Black Hills and Clean Up the Mines, um, has been fighting for the cleanup of uranium mines. She uh, and, a, um, and a group of Native people are living with measured levels of radioactivity higher than in the unrestricted areas around Fukushima Prefecture in Japan after the TEPCO nuclear disaster there. Many of the people are sick and dying. Let's see if this video will work. If you click on it, would it work? All right, right there. OK, well, we will have a, a video available. We thought maybe we'd be able to pull it off on this, but not, not right now. Uh, radiation is invisible, but we can see the damage that it has done to chromosomes. See here, decentric and other chromosomal aberrations. Uh, they're common in people who have suffered acute radiation exposure. The damaged chromosomes are found in the white blood cells and can be assessed as a biological dosimeter. In Australia, the traditional communities say, radiation breaks the stories our bodies hold that keep us healthy. Damaged stories can be passed on to our children. Radiation impacts our cells. When the reproductive cells are harmed, deformations are one outcome. This happens to all babies, plants, animals, humans. We also suffer loss of for fertility, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage, possible heritable mutations, avoidance, and reproduction, uh, avoidance of reproduction due to uncertainty. Radiation can also uh, reduce our immunity or uh, make an overactive immune system. Cancer is the most studied and the only really regulated uh, consequence of radiation exposure. When genetic material inside a living cell is damaged, sometimes our bodies can repair that damage. Otherwise, the abnormal cell may sit quietly in the body for years or even decades before it makes us sick. There's no way to predict which exposure will result in cancer. In general, more radiation equals more cancer. However, even an exposure too small to measure could sometimes result in cancer death. Children's bodies are small, so the amount of radiation delivers a larger dose. The same amount of radiation that would go to an adult uh, actually gives a bigger dose to a child. Since children are growing, their cells and their bodies are dividing more rapidly. The DNA or genetic material in the cells is more likely to be damaged during cell division. Non-cancer health effects from radiation include infertility, loss of pregnancy, birth defects, genetic damage, 
immune system problems, failure to thrive in children, particularly was seen around Chernobyl, depression, and organ, organ damage, including the heart, from high and in internal exposure. The harm from dirty uranium mining is disproportionate. Native and indigenous populations worldwide are rising to say no. Leave it in the ground and clean up the mines. Nuclear energy results in boiling water. Like burning coal or, or wood, it is the conversion of water to steam that generates the work or the heat. The immediate product of nuclear fission or splitting is massive heat and nuclear waste. Nuclear, uh, when a neutron hits a special kind of atom, the uranium-235, uh, which is a fissile or splittable atom, the nucleus splits. It releases its binding energy to heat the water, turn the turbines, and make electricity. But it also releases more neutrons and re releases more lighter radioactive elements, which are even more dangerous than the uranium. A nuclear weapon does its destruction with a blast and fire. Nuclear energy is fission or splitting with a clutch. One atom splits, resulting in other atoms splitting. The heat is collected and used to boil water. The excess heat or thermal pollution is released to the air as water vapor or back to the cooling water, uh, the, the river, the lake, or the ocean. Fission or splitting inside a reactor can be stopped by the operator's control rods. After fission, the residual heat inside the nuclear fuel cannot be turned off by itself. If not cooled, nuclear fuel will self-melt from the inside out. This is an infrared photo of a thermal discharge from Indian Point reactors in New York into the water. The reactor is up in the right-hand corner. Uh, Two-thirds of the heat generated by fission is discharged to our environment as thermal pollution. There are two cooling system types for reactors. Once through cooling uses enormous volumes of water and uh, heats the cooling source. Hot weather has forced some reactors to go offline when the cooling water gets too hot. Not for safety reasons, but because the steam cycle won't work without cold water. Steam generators, um, this is a, a diagram of uh, the water inside of a, uh, a steam generator and a cooling system. The water, um, I'm sorry, the uranium is split in the, the pink, uh, pink part of the diagram. The uranium atom is split and the water that uh, cools that reaction is radioactive. That hot water is then run through where the blue is. Uh, that heats separate water, which is then used to turn the turbines and um, make electricity. So theoretically, the secondary cooling water is not as radioactive as the primary cooling water. Fission is the splitting of the atoms to make radioactive. It makes new radioactivity or waste. Broken pieces of uranium are smaller elements, cesium, strontium, iodine, and a host of other fission products, all more radioactive than the original uranium. Uh, these byproducts are not used to make energy, they are waste. And in fact, the fuel that comes out of a reactor core after splitting of much of the uranium is millions of times hotter than the original uranium that went in. Radioactivity is measured in decay events or counts per minute, an alpha, beta particle, or a gamma ray being emitted from the nucleus per second per minute. Uranium has a slow rate of emission. It gives off its alpha particles slowly. But some of the radioactive elements that form after the uranium splits, like cesium, uh, happen to emit gamma rays much more quickly. So more gamma rays per second. And that is why the, the products of the uranium splitting are actually more radioactive than the original uranium. Worldwide, uh, there are nuclear reactors, as shown here, in North America, Europe, uh, Asia, and fewer in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a close-up of the United States. 
Note that every reactor site is also a waste storage area. Uh, the map does not include, clo include closed reactors um, and an additional four reactors that are under construction in Georgia and South Carolina. Most of the reactors are in the east where the population is. Nuclear energy accounts for most of the radioactivity in nuclear waste. Nuclear power waste has 99% of the radioactivity uh, in nuclear waste. It's very dangerous. Um, it has more radioactivity than in weapons waste. This is a typical overview of the nuclear fuel chain. Notice that at every step of the fuel chain, there's radioactive waste that is generated. And all of the steps of the fuel chain give off radioactivity, resulting in worker and community exposures, radioactive waste that will still be here for future generations. We're going to give a little overview of each of these steps. Uranium mining is the first step. The ore um, has, well, first it's uranium mining, <laughs> and then uranium milling. Uranium uh, mills take the ore from the mines, and uh, the uranium itself decays over many decades, forming more radioactive elements, which are actually um, longer lasting. So uranium is dangerous for a long time. At the mills, they pulverize the ore, treat it with acid to extract uranium and concentrate it, resulting in yellow cake. There are 20 legacy mill sites now closed. There were 20 licensed uh, mills uh, under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Milling uranium ore produces yellow cake, and the mill tailings stay behind as waste. The Environmental Protection Agency sets radiation standards, and the Department of Energy implements these at some sites. Uh, others are licensed by the states or the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There is almost zero independent oversight. Uh, most of the conventional mills are closed or closing soon. And in situ uranium mining uh, results also in the production of yellow cake, uh, skipping the step of sending it to a separate uh, mill site. Uh, but also leaving radioactive contamination right in the water from the, the ground under which it was uh, removed. This is an overview uh, schematic of in situ mining. The mine and the mill tailings from in situ mining are in the ground ready to invade the water tables. Uranium minings, uh, I'm sorry, uranium mill tailings in an impoundment in, in the form of liquid are shown in this uh, picture. Uh, slide number 34, if it dries up or floods or the dam breaks, the very radioactive material spreads across the area and the worst uh, spill in history was in 1979 in, uh, uh, the Rio into the Rio Puerco uh, in New Mexico. Uranium conversion, in order to, conver uh, in order to concentrate uranium-235, which is the uranium that we want that they need to, in order to do nuclear power and weapons, the yellow cake is converted to a gas. And then um, it's a uranium hexafluoride gas, a very toxic gas. Uh, and then um, the uranium-238 uh, that's left over is considered depleted uranium. The uranium-235 is separated out. Um, uranium in the ground has unique ratios of uranium-235 to 238. Uranium-238 is uh, more common, 99% of it. Uh, uranium-235 is only about 1%. And then there are other uh, uranium isotopes that are also present. All the steps after mining are um, there to ex exact, exact the right concentration of uranium-235 for uh, nuclear power and weapons. So uranium enrichment. Uh, is where you, uh, US commercial reactors run on low enriched uranium and bombs are made from highly enriched uranium. That means there's more uh, uranium-235 in the bomb fuel. During the Cold War, the term nuke speak was invented to describe the ways uh, that language has been used by the nuclear establishment to create a veil over the nuclear processes. Enrichment might sound like uh, bread or special classes for special children, but in this case, it's the concentration 
of uranium-235, the special type of uranium that will split or fission when hit by a neutron and start a self-sustaining chain reaction. Uranium-235, as I said earlier, is only a small percent of the uranium in nature, um, and the more common type, 238. Uh, U.S. reactors cannot use the 238, so they have to uh, separate out the 235. The process of enrichment removes the 238 from a batch, resulting in a higher concentration of uranium-235. Once removed, the uranium-238 has a new name, depleted uranium. It's still radioactive. It's still dangerous. It still has all the dangerous properties of uranium. It just doesn't have as much U-235 with it. There are, uh, traditionally there have been uh, spinning uranium in a gas centrifuge, uh, but now the uh, enrichment in the U.S. is done using, um, um, well, actually the old method was um, different. Spinning uranium gas in a centrifuge now is a newer way to pull out the uranium-235, leaving a higher concentration of 235. The first enrichment for bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki was carried out in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The technology used for commercial and military operations that were blended during the Cold War, uh, the, the technology was gaseous diffusion. That was the older method. Enrichment for the big expansion of commercial nuclear energy during the Cold War was first done in Kentucky, Paducah, Kentucky, and then at Portsmouth, Ohio. Both of these sites are now closed, and they are radioactive waste sites. A newer site in Eunice, New Mexico, uh, has been built, and uh, using the centrifuge technology pioneered in Europe and spread worldwide by Pakistani, uh, is located uh, in New Mexico. Nears and a team of supporting local residents succeeded in stopping the new site, uh, well, no, the new sites in other locations prior to its establishment in New Mexico. De depleted uranium, as I said earlier, is uranium from which much of the uranium-235 has been removed. Uh, Portsmouth and Paducah operated for over 60 years, providing fuel for both nuclear power and nuclear weapons in the U.S. and Britain. 800,000 metric tons of depleted uranium uh, in the form of uranium hexafluoride, in the form of waste, have been created, and some of it is used uh, immorally to uh, make armored vehicles and armor-penetrating shells that, um, that are littering the world's battlefields. Fuel fabrication facilities take the enriched uranium and uh, take the powder, form it into pellets, little pellets about the size of uh, your, the end knuckle of your finger, and then they stack those into 12 to 14 foot long rods. The rods are assembled a couple hundred of rods in an assembly, and that's what's done at the fuel fabrication facility to take the U-235, uh, put it into um, assemblies, which then are sent to reactors for the core of the reactor. This is a picture of a pellet. Even though it's little, it weighs about two, three, four ounces. There are about 35,000 of them in a metric ton of fuel. Um, using the World Information, on Service, uh, World Information Service on Energy's calculators, we find that making one ton of nuclear fuel results in 20,000 tons of waste rock, 4,000 tons of liquid, 4,000 tons of solid at the mill sites, 5 tons of solid waste at the conversion facility, and 46 cubic meters of liquid waste. At the enrichment site, there are 6 tons of depleted uranium. And then at the fuel fabrication facility, there's a half a cubic meter of solid waste and 8 cubic meters of liquid. So that's, um, when they say that nuclear is clean, they're not taking into consideration all the waste that's created along the way that needs pretty much permanent isolation. There are five operating nuclear fuel factories in the U.S., four in the southeast, one in uh, Washington state. There's a map of production facilities uh, here that uh, we've just mentioned. 
Every step in the fuel chain results in releases of radioactivity to our environment. Workers and community members are exposed to radiation. There is no safe level of radiation. This is a, a showing uh, the pellets, the size of the pellets formed into fuel rods. And it's actually, as I understand it, a couple hundred assemblies, uh, I'm sorry, a couple hundred fuel rods per assembly and a couple hundred assemblies in the core of the reactor. And what you're seeing here is uh, the pellets, the rod, and the assembly, and the fuel pool. Uh, the waste needs to be stored underwater because it gives off so much heat and radioactivity. And it needs to be stored for anywhere from two, three, five, in some cases, 15 years, depending how hot it is. There have been 134 nuclear reactors operated in the United States commercially. Most were built in the 1970s and 80s. They are aging, they are no longer profitable, and they are closing. Six reactors have closed since the year 2000, and many more would, except for uh, massive bailouts. As I mentioned earlier in this talk, uh, New York has attempted to give a $7.6 billion bailout to save four nuclear reactors. Uh, there's a threat in other states, including Illinois, uh, to uh, force uh, ratepayers to pay more to keep old, uneconomical reactors operating. Nuclear is not cost effective. For every dollar invested in nuclear energy, we lose the potential uh, uh, we lose energy potential, we waste money. We could get four times more renewable solar and wind and efficiency and reduce carbon at the same time if the resources were spent for renewables. Nuclear is a negative investment for the climate. Why do, uh, why do you get more solar and wind? Because combined with efficiency, they cost less to produce the same amount of electrical service. In 2010, I think this is for North Carolina, um, it was a historic crossover point where the cost of rooftop solar panels uh, became more economic versus new nuclear reactor construction. A little bit of, of history. People were fighting this craziness as back, far back as 1977 when nearly 1,500 people occupied Seabrook to prevent that construction in New Hampshire and refused to leave when the National Guard ordered them to do so. Uh, citizens were arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience, incarcerated in makeshift detention uh, sports arenas and armories where they held teach-ins and planned a movement that resulted in the cancellation of 99 nuclear reactors under construction at the time. A Nuclear Information Resource Service was founded less than a year later in 1978. The no-nukes movement swelled after the big Three Mile Island react, uh, reactor accident, uh, partial meltdown in 1979. After a 40-year dry spell you know, of no new reactors, the U.S. industry tried for a renaissance. Uh, there were efforts made in the darkened the red states here. Uh, showing which states had one or more new reactor proposals as of 2008. Only four are under construction now, two in Georgia at Vogel, two in South Carolina adding to the summer site. Uh, one in Michigan at Fermi is, is moving along despite challenges. Most others are canceled on hold or moving very slowly. The message is really not just no nukes, but no nukes, no coal, no fracking way. Rancho Seco is a um, nuclear reactor in Sacramento that was closed by voter referendum. We're jumping back to the inside of a reactor here. This is a cross-cut view. Um, this is a pressurized water reactor. I described it a little earlier. The uh, vessel on the left holds the fuel during the fission. Inside the metal walls are 2,400 pounds per square inch of pressure. The reactor is an elaborate plumbing project with hundreds of miles of pipe to circulate coolant on the nuclear side and then use uh, the steam generated on the non-nuclear side of the site, releasing two-thirds of the heat into the environment. A boiling, rot re a boiling water reactor is the same except 
instead of using pressure and keeping a second hot loop separate, the steam, the radioactive steam, uh, directly turns the turbines to make the electricity. This boiling water type of reactor, a Mark I design, uh, specifically is the kind, the cheaper model, that um, was used widely in both the U.S. and Japan and is the kind that melted down at the Fukushima Daiichi reactors in 2011. I'm going to run through some major reactor accidents that have occurred, um, originally projected to be rare or not, uh, con not considered a, a reasonable scenario. There's been an accident almost every decade. In 1957 in Russia, in uh, 1957 in Windscale, uh, 1966 the Fermi-1 experimental breeder reactor melted down. In 1979, Unit 2, a Three Mile Island, had a uh, partial meltdown in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. In 1986, Chernobyl, Unit 4, exploded and burned for 10 days, spreading radioactivity around the globe. davis Bessey in Toledo, Ohio was a close call, but it was prevented. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi, as I mentioned, in 2011, units 1, 2, 3 melted down, and unit uh, 4 fuel pool lost its structural integrity. Let's see how we're doing on time here. I don't have a clock. 8.30. Okay. Um, Three Mile Island uh, in 1979, March 28th, um, had its partial meltdown. April 26, 1986, Chernobyl, uh, and what was this then the Soviet Union, exploded and burned for 10 or 20 days. The Soviets did not report the accident until it was detected by monitors in Sweden. Local people were not told or evacuated for days. Contamination spread throughout uh, the neighboring countries. Two-thirds of the radioactivity went far and wide. It's expected that two-thirds of the long-term health impacts will be outside of the immediate area. It's just simply not possible to clean up such a mess. Prevention is the only cure. Fukushima, Unit 3, in 2011, uh, initiated by an earthquake, uh, variously scored as an 8, 9, or even a 10 on the Richter scale. The Tohoku area of Japan was rocked. The ocean receded and a tsunami returned to the shore. The wave at the six-unit Fukushima Daiichi reactor, owned and operated by TEPCO, was 125 feet or 119 feet higher than the seawall installed to protect the critical safety equipment, including pumps, diesel generators for backup. The photo here is two days later when the meltdowns inside units one, two, and three were in full swing, resulting in gaseous hydrogen and other explosive forces. Here's an aerial view of the next day of Fukushima. It's clearly the most damage of the four reactors in the atomic devastation of Japan. The reactors are a US design, General Electric, Mark I. There are 21 such reactors operating in the US. It doesn't take an accident. Nuclear reactors release, leak, vent, incinerate, uh, bury ships, solid, liquid, and gaseous radioactivity routinely. It's released at every step of the fuel chain. Waste is generated. Uh, the pellets that come out, the, the fuel that comes out of the core, as I said earlier, is literally millions of times more radioactive than the original fuel. Waste is generated. Uh, in the US, these are categorized as high-level waste, so-called low-level waste, and transuranic waste, which actually are in both the high and low-level category. High-level waste is the irradiated fuel from the core of nuclear reactors and the uh, liquid and sludge from the primary extraction of reprocessing, which is where the fuel is chopped up and uh, the uranium and plutonium extracted for more fuel. Low level, so-called low level waste uh, is everything but that uh, liquid and sludge from reprocessing and those high level fuel rods. Transuranic waste is plutonium waste above 10 or 100 nanocuries per gram. 
So-called low-level waste is a catch-all category. It includes the entire reactor except the fuel rods, the control rods, the, the fuel pool uh, hardware, the sludges from cleaning the, the uh, reactor water, the primary cooling water and the uh, reactor water, uh, liquids from reprocessing, some of them, contaminated soil and concrete, contaminated and activated metals, and it's dangerous that um, some of this would be allowed to be considered not radioactive. This I mentioned earlier that the um, radioactive waste from nuclear power is the hottest uh, part of the fuel chain. And that nuclear power waste comprises really 99% of the radioactivity. This is pie charts indicating that. Initially, nuclear waste from the reactor core has to be stored in liquid, um, water-filled pools, uh, like at Fukushima, or it will self-melt. The water also serves as a shield. Um, as you can see here, this is another uh, visual of uranium pellets. They are used to form 10 to 14 foot long pencil thin rods. The rods go into an assembly. The assemblies are in the core of the reactor. After they've been in the reactor for several years, they are then moved into fuel pools. And that, this is a fuel pool. And it, this is all done by remote handling. After five years, uh, some of the fuel can be stored in dry containers outside of the reactor. Uh, Pretty much consensus from the public interest advocates have supported the concept of hardening on-site storage, a concept called Principles for Safeguarding Nuclear Waste at Reactor Sites has been supported by organizations in every state. And uh, we've been pressing the federal government to um, have better storage at reactor sites. Um, it's uh, an uphill battle. We're now working to define more specifically what that, um, how that hardening could take place. There are proposals to move the reactor waste away from the reactors, off reactor site proposals. Um, these would be consolidated, supposedly interim storage, and uh, secondly, permanent repository. Most highly radioactive waste is still at the reactor site where it was made. And today, there are about 80,000 metric tons of this waste in storage. Dry storage of the hot radioactive waste here uh, is at every reactor site. Um, having new sites, supposedly interim sites, would really basically only add two more sites to the list. Uh, the idea would be to move the waste from all these sites across the country to these locations. And then if and when we find a permanent repository, it would move again to that location. Standing with local people together, we've stopped immoral nuclear industry and federal targeting of native lands. Here are some of the uh, heroes, hero and heroines of uh, um, fighting the high-level nuclear waste threats. Rufina Laws at Mescalero, Margene Bull Creek at uh, Skull Valley, Corbin Harney at Yucca Mountain. Grace Thorpe from uh, Oklahoma. Uh, she worked to prevent, to help uh, tribes fend off the threat of nuclear waste. Uh, 22 other tribes were approached with bribe money to find out whether a nuclear storage site, what a nuclear storage site would be like. She led the No Nuclear Waste on Native Lands campaign, and uh, all but the Mescalero and Skull Valley, let's see, 22, 22 tribes sent the money back uh, when Grace told them the real story. She served on our board for several years, and we miss her. She's now passed on. The newest plan is to bring the waste to uh, potentially temporary to a uh, allegedly temporary site uh, in Texas or nearby in New Mexico or both uh, the waste control specialist site in Andrews, Texas and another location in uh, Lee and Eddy counties in New Mexico are um, trying to, well, to, to the companies are trying to and the counties are trying to take the waste there for economic gain. Our next webinar will go in depth into the proposals for these interim storage or consolidated interim storage sites. 
And then after that, we will talk about um, permanent repositories. Yucca Mountain, a permanent repository site was chosen by Congress, the only site studied for commercial permanent waste disposal. The state of Nevada, the Western Shoshone Nation, have opposed it nonstop for 30 years. This is an entrance tunnel, but no waste has entered, and there is um, a threat that, although this has been canceled, this site is canceled by President Obama, there is a continued pressure to revive the option. And as Harry Reid, the senior senator from Nevada, retires, um, we'll see what Congress does. Yucca Mountain is sacred to the Western Shoshone people of Nevada. It's called a serpent swimming west. It's factual as well as fanciful. The site has geologic fault mines, more than 200 earthquakes a year. A young lava cone, young lava cones are nearby, indicating volcanic activity is high in the area. The Department of Energy had to cheat on its data. Uh, they had to change the rules four times to keep it from being disqualified. Uh, there's been legal action in recent years to reverse the cancellation uh, of this site. Um, the law, it turns out, can be as bad as politics in the sausage making department. Yucca Mountain is unfunded but still hanging. When it comes to moving waste, millions of people will be impacted. This is uh, current projected routes if Yucca Mountain were to open routes on roads and rails, and there are also routes on waterways and uh, the Great Lakes and both uh, oceans on both sides of the country. A similar map could be drawn to Texas or any other site. The populations along these routes have a right to know, be consulted, and have a voice in decisions on nuclear transport. And our next webinar will also discuss the, uh, the uh, issue of transportation. There would be thousands or tens of thousands of shipments uh, if uh, these sites were to open, and it would take decades to move the waste that already exists uh, to Yucca Mountain or to uh, even the temporary sites, and then more to take it to a final site. Shipping casks are vulnerable. They've not been required to meet uh, real road and rail conditions. They've never been fully tested, only computer model testing. The routes cross uh, the entire country. And there's been action. Public has gone to Congress and prevented uh, these shipments so far. We face this in the year 2017, uh, more efforts to get nuclear waste on the roads and rails. Uh, activism on transport of waste to false solution sites has been highly effective in changing the public opinion on nuclear energy. And it can be fun. We had not mock casks. Uh, transporting uh, the message around the country about the dangers of nuclear transport and uh, preventing a mobile Chernobyl, a nuclear accident on our roads and rails. The last dirty little secret is that plutonium, which is central to nuclear weapons production, is um, the dedicated byproduct of fission of uranium fuel and about 1% of the highly radioactive waste in reactors about 1% of highly radioactive reactor waste is nuclear weapons usable plutonium-239. India, Pakistan, North Korea have made bombs from reactor waste. This is a real uh, nuclear theme park idea from the boosters, the nuclear boosters in South Carolina. Called, they called it the US Energy Freedom Center, and they would like to do reprocessing. Reprocessing makes the uh, waste makes the uh, waste uh, even worse, because then you have uh, another step in the fuel chain, liquid and sludge, that uh, needs to be solidified, more exposures, more, actually a higher amount of waste. And the only reprocessing done in the US was a miserable failure, slated to cost five to 10 billion to clean up that one site. Did you get that one? Yep, we need shutdown before meltdown. And these are the shutdown sites. There is no credible solution. The waste must be isolated. Prevention is the cure, and we've got to stop making waste. So that's the conclusion of this um, presentation. And it will be online. And we will now open up to questions and comments. 
And so this is Tim Johnson. <clears throat> um, just if you want to ask a question, uh, there will be um, a hand icon on the uh, on the window that's on the right hand part of your screen. You can uh, you can uh, raise your hand there, and we will call upon you and unmute you so that you can ask your question. If you would prefer to ask your question in writing, uh, you can also do that uh, by typing a question into the chat panel on the bottom part of the window on the right hand part of your screen. And we also would ask that people who are registered for the upcoming or plan to come to the December uh, High Level Nuclear Waste Summit in Chicago, the first weekend of December, um, that we have the first um, questions come from people who are uh, participating in that, because that is the um, main purpose for uh, this, is to get background for that. And then uh, in a little bit, we will then open it up to everyone. OK, so we have a first question from Kevin Camps. Kevin, I'm going to unmute you now. Can't hear. Kevin? Kevin, are you there? Maybe it should take me. Uh, you might be. Uh, you might be muted on your computer, Kevin. Uh, you might want to uh, check that. Oh, sorry. That might be our fault. Huh? Maybe you have to take the mute all off. Nope. Nope. Okay, Kevin. We'll come back to you uh, in a little bit if you want to raise your hand again. Um, but we're looking for other questions. Carolyn? So far, there don't seem. There's a question from Carolyn Treadway. Will these wonderful slides be made available? Yes. Yes, they'll be posted on our website. How come we can't hear? A little bit of technical thing going on here. We are not able to hear you guys yet. OK, well, it appears that we have no additional questions at this time. Let's try Kevin one more time. Uh, Kevin, we're going to come back to you uh, to see if you would like to ask your question. Uh, appears that your audio is not working. Uh, looks like you uh, they had you set up to use a phone, but uh, but your phone is not connected. Here's Kevin with a written question. Sorry for the technical glitch. My question is, shouldn't it be a non-starter that Native American reservations be targeted for nuke waste parking lot dumps? President Obama praised Grace Thorpe for her work to stop the parking lot dumps targeted at her and dozens of other Native American reservations, uh, yet Obama's DOE is targeting tribes. It's, um, it's a shame. I mean, we, we, especially in light of uh, what's going on at Standing Rock, where the Native nations are getting together to protect not only their own land and water, but protect our whole climatic environment. And uh, I understand that Obama is waiting to see what happens while his troops, his uh, forces, are continuing to pepper spray and attack uh, Native American uh, protesters, or actually water protectors, at that site. Um, I think uh, that this is a, a difficult an unbelievably uh, continuing legacy of our um, atrocities against the First Nations. Oh, we have not a question, but a comment from Twala Swan. Uh, thank you. Very important information. I'm from the Spokane Reservation, and our waste is being shipped to southern Idaho. Yeah, Idaho has one of the major nuclear weapons complexes, the Idaho National Labs. And uh, it's actually people there that are uh, in the leadership of the Department of Energy to uh, look for new 
new locations to move the waste. The Department of Energy has never considered or given lip service or even acknowledged uh, that they should stop making more of it. And that is another problem with Obama. Uh, when the, To his credit, he canceled the Yucca Mountain site, but Plan B was to uh, set up a Blue Ribbon Commission on nuclear waste. And in fact, in fact that commission was all pro-nuclear power people, and their goal was to deal with the waste issue so that we can continue making more nuclear waste. And Idaho is one of the weapons complex labs that helps to promote nuclear power and weapons technology. Well, and it's worth mentioning in that context that, um, that the uh, Department of Energy's work to, uh, to promote these consolidated storage, storage sites um, is not isolated from the rest of, I mean, from, from, from other initiatives that the, that the DOE is taking. Um, there's actually been a, a task force report, uh, the, or a task force that reports directly to Secretary Moniz uh, that has drafted a report talking about how to ensure the long-term proliferation of the nuclear power industry in the U.S., um, including by promoting a national subsidy program to ensure the profitability of the existing reactors around the country uh, to develop uh, new, uh, what they call advanced nuclear reactors for the next generation of nuclear power and the initiatives that the DOE is undertaking to move high-level waste from, from reactor sites, are, they, they view as essential to uh, the streamlining the licensing process for all of these new reactors that they want to build. Um, so this is, in fact, um, you know, the, the waste issue um, in the DOE's mind is directly connected to ensuring that nuclear power continues in this country. We have a question from uh, Don in Tennessee. What should we do with the waste that is in danger of inundation from sea level rising. I would say that the best we can do with the waste that's been generated is to store it in a condition that it can be recontainerized and passed on to future generations. Um, the waste that is on the edge of, of water needs to be moved back from the water. Um, there's not a uh, guaranteed way to isolate it right now from the environment and the mechanism that the Department of Energy seems to be pursuing with its consent-based siting is uh, trying to find someone to volunteer for it before they do any kind of technical um, evaluation. The long run uh, supposedly is deep geologic repository. Uh, that's what Yucca Mountain was supposed to be. Uh, but it did not meet the criteria. And so we would need to, uh, you know, in the very long run, many believe that the answer is to uh, put it into some deep geologic storage place. Unfortunately, probably wherever it goes, it will be a sacrifice area. And until such a place is um, operational, the waste uh, needs to be moved back or stored in a way that will prevent it from being inundated. We also have this problem with the reactors themselves. Okay, we have a question from Carolyn Treadway. Where is the nuclear processing plant in Washington State? At Hanford or elsewhere? Well, the only commercial reprocessing in the U.S. was done in West Valley, New York, 30 miles south of Buffalo. Uh, the Hanford Reservation also did, um, okay, so that was um, weapons reprocessing. and that's on the Hanford Reservation, uh, which is in the eastern part of Washington. And a question from Twala Swan. Uh, have any tribes qualified to be notified when nuclear waste is being transported through their lands? I know that in the situation of the high-level liquid waste that is uh, threatens us now to be shipped from Chalk River, Canada to Savannah River, South Carolina, that um, the Seneca Nation, which is along the potential route, was notified that information was uh, found in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, uh, document, uh, dockets. Um, the, and we only know that because we saw that. Uh, usually when uh, governments, tribal or state governments, are notified, they generally don't uh, tell anybody that they're being notified. And they're also not necessarily notified of the specific time and place and route. Okay, question from Angela Bischoff. 
are you aware if your nuclear power waste in the U.S. is actually being used for nuclear weapons? Or is that all hidden from public scrutiny? I'm trying to understand if Canada's nuke waste can be used in nuke weapons despite us signing the, NN, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Well, in the United States, our irradiated fuel, go, go back to it so I can, oh, it's gone. OK. In the United States, uh, the nuclear reactor fuel is pretty much at the reactor sites in the water-filled pools. And then when those pools got filled, most of the uh, the waste then is being moved into dry storage, as we indicated in the presentation. Um, in Tennessee, there's a reactor that is actually used. The tritium that's generated is extracted to make, um, to make weapons. And so that's a direct connection between commercial nuclear power and tritium for um, nuclear weapons. Um, I am not aware of our irradiated fuel being used specifically to make nuclear weapons, um, but the fact that the first five or six steps of the fuel chain are the same for both nuclear power and weapons means that, that all of those steps are, that are enabling nuclear power are also enabling nuclear weapons. Um, the irradiated fuel from reactors has much more fission product in it because it's kept in the reactors longer, and uh, so it's um, more difficult to make it into weapons, although, as we mentioned, um, the other countries have uh, done that with their irradiated fuel. And a question from Jan Budart. I thought the DOE was considering contracts to WCS in West Texas. Now there is a new purchase of land in New Mexico between Carlsbad and Roswell. But Exelon sends its EBC waste to Clyde, Utah. Apparently there is no approval from NRC required for low and medium level waste. How did Clyde get approval to store waste? OK. We're mixing here um, the high and low categories, which is completely understandable since, and don't move them as fast because I need to go back to them. Okay. Um, the, the um, irradiated fuel, the high-level waste, um, is currently at reactor sites. In a few situations, it's been moved to centralized sites or to another reactor. The, and, and that's what's happened so far in the United States. Everything but the irradiated fuel, pretty much everything, is considered, quote, low-level waste. And then they split that into categories, A, B, C, and greater than C. A, which can have plutonium, cesium, strontium, all the really dangerous and long-lasting elements, has it in the least concentrated amount, and then it's higher concentrated in, in B and C. And then greater than C is so hot that it might not be able to go into the ditches for low level. So uh, Clive, Utah, which was formerly called EnviroCare, has since been taken over by Energy Solutions, and it takes up to Class A radioactive waste from all around the country. Uh, the dump in Texas, the Waste Control Specialist site, which opened uh, April, I think, of 2014, um, it and Barnwell, South Carolina, and Hanford, Washington, take off the classes A, B, and C, low-level waste. And the one in Texas also takes weapons low-level, so-called low-level waste. Um, I remember what the rest of it was. She wanted to know, oh, OK, so both the Waste Control Specialist site in Texas, in Andrews, West Texas, which has uh, gotten a state license uh, to take so-called low-level waste, and then also got permission to take Department of Energy weapons waste, um, they are now applying to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to supposedly interim store the high-level waste. So they got their low, and now they want to bring in the high. And they are saying that it would be a temporary or interim site. And they want the federal government to take title and liability to the waste, and then they would just store it there until someday there's a permanent repository. Uh, the Lee Eddy counties in New Mexico, which are the other one that you were describing just a little bit to the west over the border. Um, the, uh, we understand that uh, in early 2017, or maybe late this year, might also apply for a similar license to take store 
uh, supposedly interim, but again, de facto permanent, high-level radioactive waste. So we've got the operating dumps right now in Washington, South Carolina, and Texas taking so-called low-level waste. And then we've got the proposal that the Texas and New Mexico sites might take high-level waste. And for those of us that do not want to have nuclear waste unnecessarily moving on our roads and rails and waterways, our goal would be to prevent um, those sites from being approved. Okay, then we have a question uh, from Kevin Camps. Uh, just a follow-on comment, Ian Zabarte of the Western Shoshone Nation of uh, the Native Community Action Council uh, just held a three-day event in Las Vegas focused on the ongoing targeting of Yucca Mountain, Nevada for high-level radioactive waste dumps. Hillary Clinton, Clinton is opposed to the Yucca dump, right? I haven't heard her say that, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I think you know the, the conventional wisdom is that uh, you know you know both Hillary Clinton and her you know husband, uh, previous President Clinton, um, you know have been opposed to Yucca Mountain for some time, um, and certainly you know in order for the Democrats to to take Nevada, it's expected that she would need to support that position or continue that position. Um, but as we've you know, been sort of seeing uh, developing over the last few months, uh, the nuclear industry with the retirement of Senator Reid uh, really sees an open door um, to, uh, to try to ram Yucca Mountain through in the next Congress. And uh, you know, it's, um, you know, we, we believe that just like on many other, uh, many other issues, um, you know, it's going to be up to public pressure to ensure that the, um, that the Clinton administration, if, if in fact Hillary Clinton is elected, um, you know, maintains that type of position. A question from Jan Budart. Uh, comment on the waste from Japan that has been shipped to Savannah River. I'm sorry, I don't know about it. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, probably Mary Olson, who was not able to do the presentation tonight because uh, because she's sick, uh, would have been the best person to answer that question. But we can we can uh, try to get an answer um, about that um, for you later, Jim. A question from Kathleen Rood: uh, With all of the advances in renewables, what is the motivation to keep nuclear power going? It's so ridiculously costly. How does it get support? Are people in Congress all bought and paid for? I can't see how any sane person supports nuclear once you learn about its true cost financially and health environmental. Tim, why don't you take that since you just released a report today? Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's you know it's anybody's bet, uh, you know, why you know what what the sort of the you know the the root cause of the you know the, the federal government's uh, commitment to nuclear power is. Um, but it, you know, there's probably se there's probably several factors. Um, you know, one is that it's you know it's, it's a large, massive industry with the largest utility companies in the country heavily invested in it, um, and so there's a lot of political and corporate power, uh, you know, behind sustaining an industry and preventing these corporations from you know from uh, from losing their stock value, uh, you know, if the industry is allowed to if the industry is allowed to fail without financial support. Um, you know, another deeper reason for the you know is, is really the connection back to nuclear weapons. And we've seen um, some sort of dog whistling comments from the from the DOE secretary in recent months. Um, there's also been a recent report uh, put out um, in the UK, uh, you know, sort of investigating what what the UK government's commitment to nuclear power is really about. Uh, with this recent decision uh, to go ahead with a you know with a uh, what's likely to be a 30 billion dollar or 40 billion dollar new nuclear plant in the UK, and uh, you know. Some of the reasoning behind it really is that uh, that the you know that these governments r remain very committed to nuclear weapons, and they feel that that may, that the that a civilian nuclear power industry is important uh, to ensure that they have you know essentially the technical skill and you know an intellectual capacity and trained workforce um, and industries to to sustain a nuclear weapons program, and so in a certain sense they're afraid that if that if a civilian nuclear power industry collapses. That they're gonna that they're going to lose their capability to to maintain a viable nuclear weapons program. Um, so in a sense, um, you know, the nuclear the civilian nuclear industry, you know, might even be essentially a huge subsidy to a, to a, to a nuclear weapons industry. Kevin.
Kevin, I have a question from Kevin Camps. And West Valley, New York is upstream of the Seneca Indian Reservation, right? And Hanford Nuclear Res is very near the Yakima Indian Reservation, right? The Kansas Potawatomi are not Potawatomi. notified. Potawatomi are not notified of the West Valley to INL high-level rad waste unless NEARS warned the tribe in advance. Uh, that's correct. That the West Valley site is upstream of the Seneca Nation, and that the Seneca Nation were never uh, that any of us in this generation and my contacts there. Um, that they were not notified when the reprocessing took place at that site and that water in the Cattaraugus Creek was the hottest radioactive water in the country. Uh, meanwhile, kids were swimming and playing, everybody was swimming and playing and eating the fish from that river and the reprocessing went on for six years from 66 to 72. Uh, the Hanford Reservation, yes, it's um, the, the Yakima Nation land and uh, I don't know what notifications have taken place, but um, uh, for sh transport shipments, as I said earlier, the shipments, um, they try to do them without telling, telling people about it. A uh, question from Kathleen Rood. I've heard that China is looking into thorium reactors. Can you explain what's involved with a thorium reactor? So um, a thorium reactor is uh, another sort of, you know, at this point a theoretical concept for a reactor design. Um, a thorium is another radio, heavy radioactive element like uranium, um, and it can be used to create a nuclear fission reaction. Um, and in fact, the, the Indian government is actually the furthest along in developing, um, you know, at least a, a theoretical program for a thorium energy economy. Um, you know, thorium is actually a more abundant element than uranium in the Earth's crust, and you know, India itself has um, a large, large deposits of thorium. Uh, the problem with thorium um, is that, you know, despite some of the claims about it, it actually um, requires, um, you know, the, the the uranium nuclear fission cycle in order to make it possible. Um, the way that thorium can be used to create a nuclear chain reaction is actually by using um, uh, you know, an either, a, either a uranium or a plutonium fission reaction um, to convert thorium to uranium-233, or through, through, I think it's 233, um, which is highly fissile, um, but, but occurs in only the most microscopic um, uh, amounts in the Earth's crust. And so the idea is that, you know, if you could, you know, essentially, you know, through a couple generations of, of uranium nuclear power plants, produce enough plutonium um, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to sustain what's called a breeder reactor program where you use plutonium fission to make even more plutonium, that you could then have a feedstock to sustain a thorium energy economy for a long time. The Indian government, when they first promulgated their plans for a thorium energy economy, essentially was looking to not being able to start thorium reactors for 60 years while they essentially ran through a couple of generations of uranium nuclear power in order, to, in order to build up that feedstock. The whole thing is reliant on the reprocessing technology that Dee mentioned, which is incredibly polluting and dangerous and toxic. And so the idea of starting a thorium energy economy um, is actually one that sort of presumes that, we, you know, that, that, that we've already created massive amounts of radioactive waste and, you know, through, through running the same kind of nuclear power plants we have now. The next question says, West Valley, New York was both commercial and military reprocessing, and Fermi-1 in Michigan was initially proposed to generate plutonium-239 for weapons. That's correct. Uh, that's a note from Kevin. West Valley reprocessed 60% of the irradiated fuel that was reprocessed at that location between 66 and 72. 60% was from nuclear weapons and 40% uh, from commercial nuclear power. Um, I'm, earlier, uh, we talked about reprocessing having taken place in Hanford, Washington, uh, and that was weapons reprocessing. Uh, West Valley was commercial, a commercially operated facility, but it took both weapons and commercial fuel to it. And that um, in Idaho, at that Idaho lab, and in Savannah River, South Carolina, there was also weapons reprocessing that took place. And there was some reprocessing that was done both in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and in um, 
a place near Albany called SPRU, S-P-R-U. So there's been uh, more reprocessing done, but these were the, the big places, um, the major places that um, were listed. And yes, uh, Fermi 1, which partially melted down, was um, intended for some weapons use. Uh, oh, and then this continues. North and South Dakota, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Al, resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline crude oil conduit is appropriately dominating current headlines. Actually, it should be more. Uh, but it, uh, didn't the Department of Energy recently target both Dakotas and most recently Alabama for deep borehole disposal of highly radioactive waste? What's that about? Uh, the high-level waste from nuclear power and nuclear weapons had been, um, uh, is legally uh, considered uh, requiring a high-level nuclear waste repository licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So whether the high-level waste, the irradiated fuel, the reprocessing liquid sludge and sol converted into a solid uh, from reprocessing, those things would need to go to a repository with a high-level radioactive waste a repository license. Um, earlier this administration, maybe within the past year or so, Department of Energy Secretary Moniz and President Obama announced that they were going to split off the weapons high-level waste from the irradiated fuel from the nuclear power industry, thinking that maybe they might have a better chance of getting a dump for some of it. So one of the, and uh, Moniz is a strong advocate of deep borehole uh, disposal. And so the idea is to test. They had a certain amount of uh, money in the budget to do actual test boreholes in North and South Dakota were places that were um, considered, I uh, believe they were run out of South Dakota. And now we've been seeing some talk about it happening in New Mexico. The boreholes, at least in consideration, if they were to get away with making borehole disposal sites, would supposedly be for the weapons um, waste first. Uh, so that's an ongoing, simultaneous um, concern, um, along with the push to move the irradiated fuel to supposedly interim storage sites. Didn't the Beatty, Nevada, low-level radio, so-called low-level radioactive waste dump on western Shoshone land near Yucca Mountain explode due to flash flooding and sodium-contaminated waste buried in shallow trenches? Hasn't every single low-level single low radioactive waste dump ever open leaked into the surrounding environment? Yes, on both counts. It's been about a year since waste buried in the so-called low-level waste trenches at the Beatty Nuclear Waste Dump in Nevada, which is a closed dump. It closed in the 90s. Um, it did explode and um, go on fire. And they're taking steps now to try to prevent that from happening again, because there's more of that kind of waste buried there. Um, other dumps that are wetter may not have that happen, but um, it is certainly uh, was an amazing uh, thing to see since that dump, as I said, was closed in the 1990s. And now, decades later, we've got uh, waste literally exploding from so-called low-level ditches. Um, and then the, can you make that go away? Oh, I didn't see what the rest of the, OK. Well, anyway, yes, those dumps are leaking. All those so-called low-level dumps in the country have leaked into the air, water, or um, otherwise environment uh, where they're located. There are six in history. And I don't have all the details on the two newer ones in uh, Texas and in Utah. Um, but they are legally allowed to release radioactivity at the legally allowed release rate, so they don't isolate the waste. Plutonium-239 and U-235 was shipped. This is another question here. Um, Plutonium-239 and 235, slow down. Plutonium-239 and uranium-235 was shipped from Japan to the Savannah River site, supposedly a non-proliferation move. But Japan officially still plans to reprocess commercial irradiated nuclear fuel and remove plutonium-239 to use as reactor fuel. But it is an off-the-charts bad nuclear proliferation risk. So 
So that is a comment that Kevin provided for us, and that was probably in response to the question from, from Jan. So thank you, Kevin, and thanks for the question, Jan. Now we have a question from Leona, or from Carol, Carolyn, but I also wanted to say if there are people who are on the call now who are not coming to the webinar, I mean to the sem summit on nuclear waste, um, you can also type your questions in, and we apologize for not having audio for you. Hey, a question from Carolyn Treadway. I would be interested to hear about any shipment of waste from Fukushima to anywhere in the USA or anywhere else outside Japan. Well, one of the things that's going on with Fukushima waste is that it is being, um, well, some of the, some of the so cleanup waste is being put into big blue or black bags, and they're simply sitting along the roads in people's yards indefinitely. Um, the, some of the waste from the um, areas, the radioactive areas around uh, Fukushima, have been sent to incinerators around the country. It's my understanding that there has been incineration. There's been opposition to that, and I don't really know the current status of whether they are uh, actually incinerating the waste right now, but it's been touted as a way to uh, share the risk. And um, I am sorry that I don't know about waste being brought from Fukushima to other locations around the world. It's not something that I have familiarity with, um, but we can look into that further. Now we have a question from Leona. Uh, similar to last question, is the NRC required to fulfill tribal consultation obligations like federal agencies when pushing forward projects near indigenous lands or when transport of nuclear and radioactive materials are planned to go through tribal lands or reservations? I don't know. Yeah, it's a very good question, Leona. It's not completely clear to us. Um, and you know, to some extent, there's a question of um, you know even what the NRC's involvement is. Um, you know, certainly, the Department of Energy's activities um, don't necessarily have to have direct approval from NRC in all cases. And I mean, theoretically, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, te technically legally, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is part of the United States government. And so I am not a lawyer, but I would say that that agency, that commission, is required to fulfill the federal obligations. But as we know, those are not always fulfilled on any front. But it's certainly a good legal um, question. Okay, a question from Don Safer. Uh, would you detail some of the issues around depleted uranium? Things like half-life, decay cycle, battlefield exposure for both soldiers and civilians, attempts to, to dump at Clive, Utah, no, safe, no, uh, no place safe for disposal. Okay, uh, depleted uranium, as we said uh, in the presentation, is um, uranium from which much of the uranium-235 atoms have been removed, which means that it's mostly 238, but there are also other 234, 239 uh, uranium isotopes that are present. They're very long lasting, and they have a decay chain that I do not have memorized, but that um, takes longer than the history of the Earth to, to fully decay. Uh, uranium decays to elements that are longer lasting. So when you've got depleted uranium, which is, oh, <laughs> when you've got depleted uranium uh, put into a radioactive waste disposal site, you're actually uh, putting waste in that could become more radioactive as it decays, which is why it was never really analyzed to go into the so-called low-level radioactive waste dumps, which only require 100 years of institutional control, even though the waste that go in already we know are t dangerous into the 300 thousand and literally millions of years, some of the isotopes that go in. So, but you, depleted uranium is a high concentration of uh, long-lasting elements that will decay to even longer-lasting elements over time. Um, it is definitely a waste uh, and should be considered a waste, but because it's built up and there's so much of it, there have been efforts to try to utilize it, and it's unfortunately been used for um, 
tanks and uh, armor-piercing bullets. And it's especially dangerous when inhaled. And so when uh, it's released at the point of um, impact or in fires, which happen with these tanks and these bullets, um, it's liberated in its worst form, uh, uranium in the airborne form. And then it um, contaminates areas. And as I said, it's very long lasting. So it gets into the water, it gets into the air, people are exposed um, without um, it, to anyone, kids, soldiers. And uh, so it is um, a truly an unacceptable problem. And we need to prevent um, any more use of depleted uranium in that way. And our best deal is to try to isolate it, stop making more of it. Now let's well, see, it, 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 see, no place for disposal. Of OK, go ahead. Well, one of the things that's most pernicious about the use of depleted uranium in munitions, um, and one of the reasons that the military actually liked it and you know likes it and promoted it, um, is that uh, when you have a shell or a bullet that's made out of depleted uranium, um, you know when it's released at high velocity, you know when it's when it's shot, uh, the friction from the air actually causes it to catch, actually causes the uranium to catch fire, and the uranium becomes flammable. Uh, which is how it's you know able to to penetrate armor and you know basically burns through metal, um, but but what happens when the uranium metal burns in that way, is I mean it forms uranium oxide, which is you know what you find in you know in making up nuclear power plants. But the temperature at which it's burned, uh, actually the the, the dust that um, the dust that uh, that results from that uranium fire is in a ceramic form. And so it's released in this fine particulate ceramic form of dust that uh, that when it's inhaled or ingested, um, you know, is even more difficult for the body to expel. And so um, the accumulation of depleted uranium from battlefield conditions um, in Iraq and and uh, you know and, and Yugoslavia and elsewhere, um, you know, is you know in some ways um, an incredibly you know an even more toxic form of uranium exposure. Uh, than what happens, um, you know, with with uranium uh, dust that's that, that's that's uh, that, that's released, you know, during the uranium mining process. Barbara Warren asks, what kind of geological formation would they put the boreholes into? I don't know. Um, well, the the principle behind deep borehole um, storage is actually that they drill. Um, the hole deep into um, the mantle of the Earth's crust. So it's actually, you know, in some ways, it's not clear whether it's whether there is a particular type of geology that's necessary. It's more how deep they go in order to uh, in order to store the waste down below, essentially the you know um, the the top mantle of the Earth's crust. And Leona just said thank you. And Jan asked Tim. I sent the article about Japan to Savannah River to whip. Whoops, I think it's stuck at Savannah River. It's in your email. OK. okay. Thanks, Jim. And we've got Kevin Camps um, saying that, didn't the Shoban, Shoshone Bannock tribe block the highway across the reservation to prevent the import of radioactive waste to INL above and beyond anything even notified to the First Nation before. Didn't the Quebec Mohawks threaten to block the St. Lawrence River and effectively stop radioactive steam generator shipments from Bruce Nuclear in Ontario to Sweden for so-called recycling into consumer products? Isn't the deep geologic repository for all of Ontario's, quote, low and intermediate, unquote, perhaps even high-level radioactive waste targeted at Saugeen Ojibwe lands? What is the strange magnetic attraction between radioactive waste, uranium mining, et cetera, and native lands? Radioactive racism? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, 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 yes to, to those things. Um, you know, say more on that? Um, well, I mean, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, essentially all of the land in North America is, you know, is essentially, you know, historically Native American land. And so the you know the, the governments um, over the last you know several hundred years have tried to isolate uh, Native American populations, indigenous populations, you know, two small pockets of land that are politically easily marginalized. And so when they've got a pernicious environmental problem like radioactive waste, 
um, they probably want to put it in the same places where they feel like people are politically marginalized, and especially indigenous communities that um, that that are that, that lack the kind of political power um, that that would enable uh, you know that would enable um, them to put up more effective resistance. So that's you know essentially what our job is as people fighting for environmental justice in nuclear power and every other environmental issue um, is to change that power dynamic. And then continuing on that same, uh, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission insulted the Cree Nation youth and elders during a uranium mining proposal. This is also from Kevin. Uh, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission insulted the Cree Nation youth and elders during uranium mining proposal hearings a couple of years back uh, who were taking part in good faith until the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission responded in rude, bad faith. Fortunately, the First Nations and the Quebecois shut down any further discussions of uranium mining in the province. Yes, the uh, uh, Quebec has banned, and the First Nations in Quebec have banned uh, uranium mining. Oh, the First Nations have. I don't know about the whole province at this point. Hasn't the whip leak shown that deep geologic disposal be problematic? A single barrel burst costing over two billion dollars to recover. Shouldn't we stop making it? Again, we would agree with that. Um, the whip, one barrel in the whip site did explode back Valentine's Day a couple of years ago now, and the nuclear industry and the government agencies are desperately spending whatever it takes to try to reopen that site to try to recover. Uh, the concept of deep, deep geologic uh, repository as a, an option. And we have another, not a question from Carolyn Treadway. Uh, thank you so much for this webinar and for all we do to protect our planet from the scourge of nuclear. Thank you also, all of uh, those of you who are also participating. We hope that in our next webinar we'll get the audio to work. And that concludes all the questions and comments that we've got so far. As I said, this will be posted on the NEARS website. Uh, for those who uh, have not yet registered for the Nuclear Waste Summit in Chicago, uh, we hope that you will and that you will come. It's a summit uh, dedicated to those who are um, fighting nuclear waste and nuclear power. We have a question from Gwen Dubois if we want to take it. We certainly do, but can we get it? All right. Uh, Gwen, we're going to unmute you now so you can ask your question. We think it's going to work. <gasps> it's working. Is that working? Ah, yes. yes it is. Okay. Okay. Well, um, so the question about incineration, especially like in Tennessee, I know Diane, you know a lot of probably more than anybody else about that. Why doesn't anybody study whether it, you know all it does is reduce volume? It doesn't change the radioactivity or the half life or anything. Are there ultra fine or fine particulate matter that's radioactive when they incinerate? Does anybody measure this? Does anybody care about this? Well. Certainly many of us care greatly about um, the radioactivity that is liberated by incineration. There are a number of places in Tennessee, as you said, that do incinerate radioactive waste. There is uh, historically uh, an incinerator on the Bruce Peninsula in Canada that's been incinerating waste. Uh, and uh, yes, in Japan, they're actually, you know, at least at one point, were incinerating in regular incinerators radioactive waste. It's the worst, one of the worst things you can do with it because uh, once it's inhaled or ingested, um, it, it gets into the body. And uh, depending on which isotope, if it's plutonium, it lodges in the lungs. Uh, there's a biological half-life, the time that it takes for the element to be released from the body to be um, either exhaled or released with uh, excrement. But there's also a um, possibility that it could lodge in bones or in genetic material and continue to radiate from within. And so then we have internal exposures. And it's one of the things that um, the government agencies have not really paid much attention to. They mainly do their studies, the National Academy of Science studies that estimate that, that try to calculate the health effects from ionizing radiation the biological effects of ionizing radiation reports, beer 1, beer 4, beer, beer 7, uh, they are really only looking at external uh, exposures, the radioactivity that 
gamma rays that come from the outer, uh, outside the body. They do not take into consideration of the internal exposures, the concentration in the organs. So yeah, it's a, certainly um, another avenue of fight, and people do care about it. Um, but there's not necessarily uh, monitoring being done. That's something we need to, to do more. And something that infuriates me very much is that uh, it's very expensive and, and sometimes difficult to actually monitor. And you, have to, you can't monitor all the air everywhere, and uh, radioactivity can go in plumes. It can waft back and forth. And so your monitor might miss it. Uh, the monitors are often uh, not even designed to pick up the type of radioactivity that's being emitted. So uh, we do need to move into more of protecting ourselves with monitoring and learn more about it, but it's something that we're at the very beginning stages of. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Any other questions for, from folks? We've got two more whole minutes here in our webinar. Any other hands? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this webinar on nuclear energy, radioactive waste, and introduction to the fuel chain. And uh, we hope that you'll join us again next week when we talk about the issue of central, supposedly interim centralized storage of high-level waste, irradiated fuel, and transportation.